But right now, it is time to meet and to talk to our very special guest on the show today, Teresa Bazaar, whose professional singing career started in the band Guys and Dolls. There's a whole lot of love in gotcha. Teresa was born in Canada, but soon moved to England to Cheltenham. She went to a performing arts school and at 17 successfully auditioned for the pop act Guys and Dolls, who had a number of hits in the mid-70s. And also in the band was David Van Day, and they became romantically involved. But after complaining about the musical direction of the group, they were sacked. They formed Dollar, creating a plethora of perfectly produced pop songs. Their first hit in 1978 came when punk and new wave was still prominent and more followed in the early 80s, when electronic music and the new romantics came on the scene. Trevor Horn was their producer then. But when relations between the duo became increasingly tempestuous, Van Day quit the band and Dollar split up in 1983. Both Teresa and David released solo material, but neither enjoyed the same kind of success as they did as Dollar. So they reformed and had a hit with an erasure song in 1987, but a year later split up again. Teresa emigrated to Australia, where she still lives, and she's formed a new band with a new male singer to create Teresa Bazaar's Dollar. And her UK tour opens at the Stables in Milton Keynes on September the 20th. I'm absolutely delighted that Teresa joins us from her home in Sydney. Welcome. Hello, Mike. Thank you so much for having me on. I'm very excited. Very, very. I'm just fearful of pressing the wrong button or something, a tab or whatever, go, should I click that, do that one? It's just, a, it's kind of an age thing, but I'm fearless now with what I'm doing anyway in the future. So just bring it on is what I say. And if I make a mistake, then everyone will smile and go, oh, OK. <laughs> well, let's talk about this tour, because Dollar went on a reunion tour in 2002, and you and David appeared on a couple of TV shows, Reborn in the USA and the UK Pop Goes the Band, and you were at a show that celebrated Trevor Horn's career. Other than that, what else have you been doing, Teresa, in recent years? Oh, that's a very big question. Thank you, Mike. (laughs) I left everything behind after Ola Moore hit the top 10. I came to Australia and I did venture back, as you said, for those reality shows. I was always curious to say, is that really where I should be? And then I dipped my toes in and thought, no, no, thank you, and came back to Australia. I raised a family. I've got two gorgeous kids, two boys, very close to them both. And I have a lovely partner here in Sydney. But I've always been dabbling, I think, in things. And music has always been very close to my heart. But it was only COVID that threw up this idea of writing a book. And from starting to write a book, I re-engaged with all the music Mm. and realised all the things that we'd recorded. And that's really how it all happened. Is it quite a big step, though, to form your own version of Dollar with singer Stephen Fox and to go on a UK tour? By the sound (laughs) of it, you've not been performing those songs live for quite a few years. Oh, I'd say give it two decades, more or less, or add some. (laughs) Yeah, it might be crazy. I started writing the book. That made me open Pandora's box and revisit all those emotions and feelings. And it was always about the music for me. And then I started thinking, well, I'm writing a book about the memoirs and all the silly PR stunts and lighting fire to tablecloths and throwing food at David, which I never really did. It was just posed because I'm not like that, really. And then I thought, well, how does it end? Because, you know, you've got to have a beginning, a middle and an end, as Winnie the Pooh and Christopher Robin says. As it went along, I'm thinking, well, the end of my book ended up becoming about ageism because I'm getting old as I'm 68 and when I turned 60 I started to stutter when I kind of said how old are you as I've gone through my 60s I've become sort of more courageous and more just feisty and just really backing myself and my thoughts and I thought with this book the thing is ageism so if I'm going to talk about ageism and doing things when you really need to do them because we don't know how much time we have. I thought, well, the best thing is to right foot, left foot, just walk the walk. So I thought, well, that's what I'm going to do. That means coming back to the UK, reconnecting with my fans, 
reinventing my music. Some of it will be the same, some of it will be creatively quite different. That's how it's all been going on. Well, we'll talk more about the tour and the gigs in a moment. Let's play your debut hit record with Dollar from 1978, Shooting Star. Still sounds fantastic to me, 45 years on, dollar and shooting star. And my special guest here on BBC Three Counties Radio is one half of that duo, Teresa Bazaar, talking to us from her home in Sydney. So you've got this tour, you're appearing live at the stables in Milton Keynes on Wednesday the 20th September. Tell us about the vocalist playing the part of David Van Day, Stephen Fox. Is he a man that you've worked with before and you've known a while? Oh, yes, I've known Stephen for some time. He joined me when I did my one night only in the UK in 2019. And who would do that, create a show from the other side of the world in Sydney to come to the UK and try and put all that effort into just one show? And I didn't really know why I was doing it, but I did it. And I now know that was the brainchild of this precursor into what I'm doing now. So Stephen sang with me for a few songs on that show, which is more like a chat show. He was brilliant. He is the most creative, sane, intensely organized man I think I've ever met. His voice is extraordinary. We seem to have this synergy where we chat a lot. Of course, we're on opposite sides of the world. But he kind of says, but you said that the other day. I said, no, I didn't. He said, but you did because I've had that idea. I said, no, I didn't actually. And we seem to have the same ideas but not having discussed them, which is kind of crazy, but cool. And the band, are you putting that together in Australia or will you come over before the tour and rehearse with them here in the UK and they'll be British? (laughs) It's madness, really. The band's being created in the UK and we are in touch and we are rehearsing across the globe, which is fabulous and it kind of, it's working. Stephen's in charge of the band, but we are constantly in touch and it's all kind of just evolving. It's a... a magical thing and I'm going to be arriving in the UK at the end of August and then we're going to have an intensive rehearsal. By the sound of it, you're pretty confident about this, but there must be a touch of nerves about it too at this stage or not? You know, I thought about this back at the beginning of January. All came about with social media because of the book. I have a fantastic literary agent in the UK, Matthew Hamilton, if he hears this, will go, "Mm mm-hmm, she's mine. Um, He's brilliant. And we've had some really interesting feedback about my book and the one thing acquisition was oh she doesn't have much of a social media following which is what I successfully ignored for about 20 years and on New Year's Eve I said to myself you just got to get into it now so I made a commitment and I've been doing social media every day since the 1st of January and so everything's building and that's why I'm hopeful. I just believe in what I want to do now because as an older person, it's a message really to everybody. You just can't waste time really. If you believe in something, just get up and do it. Have a go. Give it a go, as they say in Australia. Give it a go. There's nothing to lose. Teresa Bazaar, one half a dollar is our special guest. Let's play the band's second hit from 1979, Who Were You With In The Moonlight? Dollar on BBC Three Counties Radio. Who are you with in the moonlight? So, Teresa Bazaar was born in Canada, came at a young age to live in Cheltenham in Gloucestershire. She took ballet classes from the age of two and a half, decided then that she wanted to be a performer. When you were a bit older, around 12, I think, you thought you weren't good enough to be a professional dancer, so you thought about being a singer and a dancer. You went to performing arts school. You ended up in a pantomime, I think, playing the lead in Snow White. And then when you were, what, about just 19, in 1974, you joined Guys and Dolls. David Van Day was in that band, and you had a number two hit, I think. There's a whole lot of loving going on, kept off the top spot by the Bay City Rollers and Bye Bye Baby. It was originally a TV biscuit advert. So why did you leave Guys and Dolls? Ah, oh, we got kicked out. I would never have wanted to leave. I'm a very loyal person. I was learning so much and fell in love with pop music after being a classicist for all those years, ballet and classical music. We got thrown out because David was 
very um, dissatisfied, I suppose one would say, didn't get the camera shots, wasn't getting any lead vocals. And he, he was kind of like Donny Osmond and David Cassidy sort of all rolled into one. And yet he wasn't getting the opportunity. So he was complaining about that. And I was complaining about the musical direction because I'd fallen in love with pop, as I said, and production, really. David got thrown out and because we were an item. I got thrown out too, which was um nightmare. I was devastated. The original plan was for him to go solo, I think, with you doing writing of songs for him and producing. But you were spotted, I think, by a young producer and a manager who actually signed you without hearing any of your demos. He didn't hear what you were like together. David wasn't getting the interest that he'd hoped as to sign as a solo artist. And I was actually at home pretending to be his secretary in my very English voice. Hello, this is David Van Day's assistant here. Please could I speak to the A&R department of CBS? <laughs> Some silliness. And it wasn't really leading to anything. And we met up with this entrepreneurial like management to men who said, I think you know of a new record label that's um, looking for acts. Could we maybe pitch you as a duo? And that's what they did. His name's Chris Yule, who has the most extraordinary ears in the business, and we're still friends to this day. And he had heard all the guys and dolls stuff and saw us as an image. And of course, Greece was the big deal. John Travolta, Olivia Newton-John, and Donnie and Marie in the US. But there was no girl-boy duo in the UK. And he saw an opening. And he just said, I'll sign them. He had a couple of demos, but he didn't hear us actually sing, sing, sing. No, he just looked at us and said, I'll sign them. That was it. At the time, I was incredibly lucky. And I was thinking, it's never my idea to be a duo. But I'd been offered a solo deal by EMI Holland. And I immediately turned it down because I said, no, 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 you've got the wrong person. He's the one that wants the solo <laughs> solo gig. I don't want to be a solo artist. So um, when we were offered the opportunity of being a duo, it was just luck. It was luck all the way and no idea what we wanted to sound like. But we were so lucky and fortunate that David Courtney had two songs he'd written and he was meant to be our producer, but he was actually too busy. He'd been allocated another artist. And so we got given Chris Neal, Christopher Neal, who'd just done the Marshall Haynes single. And he was just the hottest, hottest producer in the UK. Teresa Bazaar is my guest from Dollar here on BBC Three Counties Radio. So let's talk about the Dollar sound. Now, earlier this year, I spoke to Paul Young and we discussed the sound that he was looking for when he first signed as a solo artist to CBS back in 1983. And this is what he said. They said, right, first thing we're going to do is we've got to get the best musicians in the UK for playing soul music and we'll get the best brass section and all that and this sort of stuff. And I said, no, I don't want to do that. And they went, well, what do you want to do? I said, I want to make perfect pop music. And they were saying, like what? And I was saying, like, who be within the moonlight by Dollar? And they went, what? You want to sound like Dollar? I went, no, <laughs> but that's a perfect pop song. And I want to be able to make one of my own, you know, or some of my own. Not a bad compliment, is it, eh? Oh, my gosh. He is the most extraordinary artist. And um, we met a couple of times, you know, when you're skulking the hallways of Top of the Pops and everyone's, you know, they're either super confident and saying hi to everybody. And me, I'd be very, very quiet and very nervous <laughs> thinking about how I'm going to perform. But Paul Young's just a legend. And every time I heard his voice on the radio, I was sort of like, dissolve because he had the perfect face and the perfect voice and the perfect sound and I thought that it just happened by accident so thank you for sharing that it's a wonderful thing to hear I'll send him a message actually now after the interview none of us knew what the new sounds would be and I respect the late 70s sound so well but the beginning of Chris Neal's vision for shooting star and who with the moon it was a transitionary sound setting us up for the 80s, which was the whirlwind. I mean, it was like roller coasters in a fun fair. Let's move into the 80s with Dollar here on BBC Three Counties Radio. This is one of four singles that were great top 20 hits, produced by Trevor Horn. Mirror Mirror by Dollar from 1981, a number four song. As I say, Trevor Horn is your producer, and you just phoned him up, didn't you, saying, hey, Trevor, Chris Neal's moved on. Would you like to work with us? 
I think I am shy, but when I know what I know, even at a young age, I was very, very focused, just driven, I suppose. And yeah, I was a bit late to the party with Video Killed the Radio Star. But when I heard the separation of sound, I really understood production and the bass drum and the vocals. I kind of thought, that's it. I actually knew I was a driven machine. (laughs) In those days, you can actually politely ask a record label to give someone's phone number out, and they did. And I phoned Trev, and he was a bit, I don't produce other acts. I said, yes, I know, but maybe could you just come and have a chat? And so he did. And we met in a Japanese restaurant in Soho in London in 1981. And that's pretty kind of out there, really, because no one ate Japanese food, but we kind of did. And it was interesting. And he wasn't really interested, actually, <laughs> during the conversation. But we mentioned that we were going to appear at the Tokyo Yamaha Song Festival. And when we mentioned Tokyo in Japan, his eyes just lit up. He suddenly got really interested. That changed the dynamic of the chat. And um, then he said, well, I'm going off to have a songwriting session with Bruce Woolley tonight, and I'll just get back if something happens. So I went away pretty deflated after that, thinking I'd hope for something a bit more tangible. And to my great surprise, Trevor phoned me the next day, said, I had a great writing session with Bruce, and um, you've got this song that's kind of interesting, and would you and Dave would like to come and do some backup vocals on it? And I, I thought, I went, yes, please. And that was actually the blueprint for handheld in black and white. Well, Trevor Horn is a very talented guy, but when I've heard him interviewed you know, all these years later, he seems to me to be very humble and modest about his achievements, doesn't really want to talk about his own talent and his own creative input to the stuff that he's done. And, of course, he then left you and he went on to work with ABC and that massive album, Lexicon of Love, <laughs> onto Frankie Goes to Hollywood yeah. and the Pet Shop Boys and <laughs> Seal. You must feel quite proud that he used your records as a blueprint for producing them. Yeah, I met Trevor when he was young. He was just coming into this incredible genius that he has. And no, I don't think he has a true understanding. If you're if you're inside this amazing feeling you have, it could be like um, a whirlwind or something. But he's a very humble, sensitive, empathetic man. And maybe he does now, but... Then he didn't have any understanding of the profound impact he was having on people's lives because he was just doing his thing. He was so authentic, and he still is. He always does what he thinks is right. I've actually taken a string from his bow on that. I'm authentic too. I'll only do whatever I think is right musically. I won't let anyone push me now. I did in my younger years. I won't do it now. And I think Trevor's always been, that's his thing. I think that's probably his secret weapon, really. He's just been so profoundly authentic and always just gone after what he wanted. My special guest here on BBC Three Counties Radio is Teresa Bazaar. So Dollar enjoyed massive UK chart success. Ten top 40 singles, including five top tens and three albums. And a girl-boy duo was brilliant because you as a girl got all the adulations from the boys and David Van Day got all the adulation from the girls. Had pictures of you on on their wall and that. Did you embrace that being famous thing and being pin-ups? You enjoyed it? Not really. David did. That's what he'd always wanted. I mostly hid behind the couch and kind of stuck my head out when we're on the telly, kind of going, oh, my gosh, and what did I look like then? I was very nervous, very underconfident, which is the opposite of, obviously, my persona, my public professional persona. But I was very nervous and underconfident, which um, probably just made me work harder, I suppose. In an industry at the time which was very much dominated by men, who might have been controlling you, who wanted to shape your image, tell you what colour hair you should have and how you should dress and look, right? Oh, I'm glad you asked the question. <laughs> Absolutely, 100%. It was a very sexist industry. And I think even though I was very humble and quite shy, but I created this persona and I was trained to, you know, to, to be professional and perfectionist, I kind of didn't understand why it was like that and why I was always like 
designated to be the fluff, you know, the pretty bit on the side, you know, the icing on the cake kind of thing. So something inside me was rumbling away, going, well, doesn't necessarily have to be like that. So fab question. Thank you. You still in touch with David Van Day or not? David doesn't talk to me. It's a little bit sad, really, but I think he's very busy doing other things. So uh, maybe with the tour coming up, he might want to get in touch. Who knows? I don't know. He could bring a burger van round and <laughs> stick it in front of the theatre, sell some burgers. I'd be very happy to see him. But that's OK by me. At the time, he must have hurt you, though, when you split up as a couple and then when uh, he left Dollar for the first time. But then, of course, you invited him back and you came back and you had that hit with an Erasure song in 87, Ola Moore. There's a lot of stuff that's been documented on social media and online and all the rest of it. But if he said, well, could I come on stage and do some backing vocals for a number? You might say yes. I think I'd love to hear from David. You can't shove away, you know, and compartmentalise in your head because that will only come back and bite you as you get older. All the years and the wonderful times we had together. I mean, we were lovers for seven years, for heaven's sakes. My first boyfriend, you know, so there's always a part of yourself that is going to be part of that person. As I said, you go along in your life and, um, yeah, I would love to hear from David, love to hear what he's doing, how he is. If he wants to come and say hello, that would be great. So we have been talking here on BBC Three Counties Radio, possibly her first BBC interview for a long, long time, to Teresa Bazaar. And you can see Teresa in her new tour this autumn, Teresa Bazaar's Dollar, Ola Tour, on Wednesday, September the 20th at the Stables in Milton Keynes. You can book your tickets now on their website, stables.org, and you can follow Teresa on Facebook and on Instagram and on Twitter. You're going to be playing, I guess, what, all of those 10 top 40 singles that you had, maybe one or two album tracks from Dollar, and maybe tracks from your own solo album, The Last Kiss. Will you be doing them in the same style and making them sound like they did back in the day, or are you going to reinterpret them, reimagine them? Oh, I love your questions. I mean, we're going to have to have like a constant chat every two weeks to just keep going because um, you're brilliant. Um, <laughs> thank, you. thank you so much for the question. <laughs> well, it's a live show. It's a live band. It's no, no lip syncing, no backing tracks or anything. So it's a live band. I haven't done that for a very long time. That's why I'm so excited. But they will be a live band, but as they are remembered by all the audience. But some of them are going to be switched up a bit. And I'm very happy and excited to taking a couple of the big hits, but changing them up a bit to just put an artistic bent on it, because that's part of a show, isn't it? And it's my reinvention of one of the songs maybe I've written clue just change it up a bit to bring out the lyric or bring out the melody in a different way it's like a revisiting a moment in time for when you remember who you were and who you were dating or getting married to or what your job was or what you were going through in your life going through the timeline with the music but it will ramp up a bit as we get towards the end there is going to be a real nod to the middle to late 80s production that made dance, pop dance, became this incredibly euphoric period of time. You know, when everyone was going out and dancing and, and the melodies were so good and everyone was happy, it was happiness. So that would be my nod to my musical experience as well with other songs from other artists. I will be absolutely saying, everyone, get up off your seats. I've told everyone on social media, I want everyone to be sparkly and glamorous. You get dressed up when you come to the show and be ready to get up and dance in the aisles and have some fun, 100%. Sounds like a good plan to me. Theresa Bazaar's yeah. dollar, Ola Tour, comes to the stables in Milton Keynes on Wednesday, the 20th September. So you've got plenty of time to get your tickets, plenty of time to plan your outfit and look sparkly. I've even got some merchandise. I mean, crazy. Think about it. Back in the dollar days, we never had a merch company. No T-shirts, nothing like that. And now I've got mugs and coasters and T-shirts. Go figure. It's amazing, isn't it, what you can do? Gotcha, to use a song yeah, title. Yeah, exactly. 
Brilliant. <laughs> it's been such a fantastic pleasure for me to talk to you, Teresa. As I say, I used to play a lot of these records on the radio when I was first getting going in 1981-82, and they're still eminently playable and wonderfully enjoyable 40 years or more on, I have to say that. I'm not just saying it, but I really do mean it. So thank you for sparing some time now with us from your home in Sydney, Australia. Well, Mike, I am in your debt because you are the most wonderful interviewer. So happy to be on the BBC. And um, I hope to meet you in person. That would be a pleasure. And any time you want to ask me anything, I will be <laughs> here at your disposal. Um, and I can't wait to get to Milton Keynes. It's our first show. I will be buzzing. As I said, I've got sparkly shoes and sparkly dresses. I'm practicing all the songs and I won't forget the lyrics. And I've got some stories to tell as well. So come and say hello. Well, that was the last hit that Dollar had in the UK back in 1987. And it made it to number seven. What a delight to have Teresa Bazaar on the show. And there's a real story about that uh, particular track because she loved the sound of Erasia at the time when they were making records and they just started as a duo, you know, Andy Bell and uh, Vince Clark. And she loved their album, their second album called The Circus, which she'd heard. So to get some production ideas, she thought she'd go out and buy that. And she went to this record shop. And instead of buying The Circus, they sold her the debut album by Eurasia, which was called Wonderland. And that's uh, the album that had Ola Moore on it as well, which is why they then recorded that. Uh, such a delight to talk to her. Maybe we can get her back, who knows, in September ahead of that gig, because there are loads of more questions. And she talked about the early hits by Dollar were um, written by David Courtney. He was the guy that had written the early hits for Leo Sayer.